Just to introduce myself again, my name's Ian Wright. Um, contrary to my title, I've been uh, sort of called a geotechnical engineer by the council. I'm actually a geologist, or as if you've been across to Tony Tag, a uh, techno pinhead, which uh, is a new one, but uh, I'll live with it and understand what he's getting across. So what I'm gonna um, start off today talking about is, um, I'll run through a quick overview of what uh, myself and Peter are gonna talk about. I'm, the, uh, I'm going to concentrate on some of the science behind the um, slope and stability in the Port Hills. So um, basically we're talking about three types of um, geohazards, as I'd call them. The first is uh, rockfall, so the influence of individual rocks um, falling down hills. Cliff collapse and then land stability there. It's really land instability, um, which is a sack name for um, mass movements, landslides, etc. Okay, and then um, I'll touch a bit on the, um, the life risk issues that um, Tony um, very well um, sort of discussed earlier. And then um, I'll hand across to uh, Peter Doolin who will look at the, uh, the, uh, the policy and the regulatory um, framework that we're looking at. Um, but just before I, I get on to the technical side, I think um, basically um, before I talk to the slide, um, obviously, a lot of this work is in response to, um, to the recent series of earthquakes, and you can see the, um, that picture there. It's basically a plot of some of the major um, aftershock and earthquake sequences that we went through 2010-2011. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that um, the Port Hills, because they're essentially a slope, um, they've always been susceptible to land instability. In other words, we have a rock and a soil mass that, uh, with the influence of gravity, will potentially want to move down the hill in uh, all sorts of manners. But as we're all aware, um, the last three years we went through a sequence of events um, that have changed our understanding and um, some of the hazards in the Port Hills. And that was essentially the, uh, the, the earthquake sequence. And as well, we'd, we all know we've got a series of earthquakes um, the, the, um, the big one was literally in the seat of our pants and we, we got a, a big kick by that. And basically the ground shaking associated with the, um, the seismic uh, waves was responsible for causing a lot of um, land instability. So that's what we would call a trigger. Um, so that's a trigger mechanism that um, promotes the land instability. Now there are other trigger mechanisms that we're aware of. Um, the, the, the obvious one that uh, we're sitting in between the moment is last, week, last week's extreme rainfall event and fingers crossed, hopefully not another one tomorrow. But rainfall or excessive water and slopes are not a good mix. Um, basically water is a lubricant and so it helps things slide down slopes. Okay, so those are the two big triggers. Um, they are for slope and stability, there are other triggers. They can be human influence. It's not a good idea generally to cut the toe off a slope. Um, there can be um, frost uh, or ice and um, the mechanical influences of, of them and how they force rocks apart, as well as vegetation. So what I'll do is, um, before I climb into a bit more of the rockfall um, issues, uh, basically I'll just put into context that after the, um, the, during the earthquakes essentially, the sequence, um, we, we realised very quickly that there were issues in the Port Hills and sadly we had a number of fatalities. So we're dealing about um, geological hazards that have an inherent life risk. And if you're next door um, talking to Tony Tay, you're listening to his talk, you, you'd understand a bit more about that. But what we're talking about is a risk to life, which is inherently a different risk to that of the flat land red zoning. After the, uh, the, 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 the earthquakes, there was an, a response, an emergency response by our community. And part of that was the um, geotechnical community offered their time as volunteers to head into the Port Hills and start gathering some data, um, a lot of information, which we have now based our science. That group was known as the Port Hills Geotech Group. And subsequent to that, council then took on um, this group for, for uh, advice and a number of services. At the same time, we're lucky enough to have um, GNS Science, a Crown Research Institute, um, that, that came down and helped and basically formulated a lot of the science um, work that, we, um, that we've got now. 
So um, basically world leaders, and one of the obvious reasons is that uh, we live in you know, one of the, the world's laboratories for this type of thing. So th the upside is that w it's great. We've had a huge amount of science and technical input, um, understanding of these things. The downside is probably it will, you know, it, um, when we move from technical science into policy and regulation and how it affects people, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm a simple technical pinhead. So first, uh, first slide. Um, basically, it's a it's an overview of the Port Hills. You can hopefully see Littleton Harbour down in the bottom, and it sort of covers the uh, the top of the Port Hills. Now, there's the thing that really should strike you is that there's a large number of red dots. Now. Those red dots were individual boulders that had detached from the, um, their homes up in the Port Hills and the, the upper slopes, and they had rolled down into the, to the lower slopes. And many of those rolled down through our existing communities. And it was the, one of the Port Hill Geotech's group's jobs to go out and map these boulders, map their size, and how far down the slope they got. So that was the, uh, the first attempt. We started getting some of the, uh, the scientific information. And uh, they certainly didn't go out to try map every boulder that came down in the, in the hills. That'd still probably be there. But the, the fundamental idea was to find out how far these boulders went. Now, there's a double slide in there. So, Looking at the rockfall um, hazard, so very simple model. You have a, uh, a very steep uh, top of a cliff or a, a, a bluff, and a rock or a series of rocks under a trigger, or in some sort of natural, you know, it's time, as I would say, it had just come. For whatever reason, its weathering profile had meant that it was no longer stable. These rocks detach, and in the earthquake, of course, there was a big shove by the seismic energy. A lot of rocks detached from their, their source and they became essentially boulders, and they rolled down the slope. Now, our task was to try and understand how far and where they went, and associated with that is the amount of energies, because there's an inherent life risk associated with that. Now, if you follow cricket, you'd understand um, when you get a bowler, trying to get a batsman out, you have a seam bowler and a spin bowler. They use a sphere, or called a ball, and they will spin it, and they will try and beat the batsman. Now the batsman, if he's good, he will understand that and he'll make runs. If he's bad, he goes out. So that's the uncertainties with you looking at a single sphere bouncing on a hard object and it can go in a different direction. What the geotechs, um, the challenge was that we're not looking at spheres, we're looking at all sorts of irregular shape, boulders, sizes, weights, slopes. Is it a hard slope, a soft slope? Will it bounce? Which way will it go? So this is where we start looking into the areas of uncertainty. Um, and again, as was pointed out, we don't work, us geotechs, it's not an exact science. We will be the first to tell you that. So all this information we get is good technical information, but when we start adding it together and start looking at um, the consequences or the probabilities of something happening, it becomes very fuzzy. So the bottom line is that with all that information, we looked at rock falls and we gathered that information and we said, right, we can understand that and we're going to put some risk parameters around it. So it's about a life risk for somebody living in the Port Hills. So we did that and GNS gave us a series of maps which based our, we base our policy on. But maybe if I can just emphasize a few things. I'll just flick up all three. The first, um, the one on the left, you can see there's a big uh, giant um, divot out of the lawn, and then there's a hole in the, the, the dwelling below. Now that is a large boulder that bounced once and went straight into the house. Okay, the, the happy chappy standing on the right, that is a reasonably large boulder, probably 30 cubic meters, um, sorry, 30 tons, 10 cubic meters. It once lived up at the top of that hill behind him, and during the earthquake it detached and it flew down the slope and then rolled through the house above and came to the stand where the man is. And the, 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 the last slide, you can see a smaller boulder, you can, but you can see the, um, it hit the tree at about two meters height and it severed the tree. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that these boulders, that, um, that one on the bottom picture is probably the size of a, um, of a chair, you know, half a cubic meter in size. But at 50 kilometers an hour, 
it, when it's moving, because of the uh, kinetic energy it's got with it, it has a huge amount of energy. The same amount of energy as a car going along at 50 kilometers hour, an hour and it has a, a head-on collision. You can argue, you can, some of us had the, the, the sad um, pleasure, sorry, sad sight of, of seeing this firsthand, and, but a lot of people have seen the, you know, the consequence of car crashes. A boulder that size has the same energy as a car crash. Now, the worrying thing is when the, the boulder's velocity increases, so if it's going at 100 kilometers an hour up to its terminal velocity, the amount of energy doesn't double. It doesn't go from 50 kilometers an hour to 100, so you don't times it by two. It goes more than four times. So when it's up at its top end and when it's flying along, it has a lot more energy. So th these have consequences. All right, so I'm just going to move on to the next um, the geohazard, which uh, is cliff collapse. Um, very simple um, from a technical perspective. The front ends of our cliffs, and we have many in the Port Hills, um, basically the seismic energy um, got focused on these areas, these ridges, and amplified, increased, so much so that it basically the front of the cliffs toppled off. They, they collapsed, and basically, and because there's a large volume of... Um, material associated with these, they inundated or covered with debris large areas below, okay? So um, understandably, you can see that's a, a huge life risk situation there. A couple of examples. Um, the obvious one on a Peacock's, Peacock's Gallop, and as uh, somebody in the previous um, session we had said he was obviously quite a uh, clever guy, Mr. Peacock, because he was obviously galloping past there. Uh, he knew the risks associated with that. Um, just from a technical perspective, um, when you look at the, uh, the, the picture on the right, you can see the, uh, the debris cone below where all the, the rocks are. You can also see there's some building rubble there. Now that um, came from the property above. And what we know and what GNS have worked out for us is that uh, if we have another similar um, event, the, the cliff is going to recess or it's going to collapse back to a similar amount, and with that it's going to uh, have a, an effect on people's lives and their properties above and potentially down below. So, okay, cliff collapse is a bit of a no-brainer. We can understand the risks around that. Right, so then we move on to our third topic, which is, uh, we've uh, called it mass movement areas in the Port Hills. Now, I want to just spend a moment here and try to put this into a context. Um, as I said earlier, we know in the Port Hills we we've, we've have ongoing um, slope stability issues anywhere in um, New Zealand or the world where you have slope and you have rain, etc. you have slope and stability. That's what we call our business as usual scenario. Um, but what GNS Science have basically come um, along and told us with, with all their, their geotech advice has said, look, that aside, because of the recent series of earthquakes, um, we've noticed that there are areas in the, uh, the Port Hills that are that the area, the land has been damaged and it's showing signs that it's either moved in a limited manner or given another trigger, it may move again, um, basically, and uh, create a lot of problems. And that was a direct result of the ground being damaged because of the earthquakes. Okay, so try to separate the two, the business as usual situation from the, the mass movement areas mapped by GNS from earthquake-induced land damage. What GNS has said was um, they've looked at these areas, they've mapped them, and they said, well, we think that we, we're going to put them into three classes. Class one is uh, the one that we're worried about. By its definition, it means um, if this mass movement were to fail, it will, um, the material will leave the site and inundate, so like a cliff collapse, it'll run down the hill, and because it's either... Uh, a fluid soil or a rock mass, again, the probabilities of it causing catastrophic dam damage are quite high. So those are called the class one areas. But at the same time, and sorry, just to put into context on the map, those are the yellow blobs. And you'll see they're pretty much all associated with areas of cliff collapse. So it was just an enhanced understanding of how the grounds reacted in these areas. They also said um, we have another two classes, class two and class three. Um, I'll flick on. So we've now moved across to the western sides of the Port Hills. And from there you can see there's um, essentially brown and blue areas. Now these are class two or class three. Um, technically 
there's not much difference between them. They're both areas that um, they call toe slumps. They, they formed in areas where the slope of the hill changes um, and gets more gradual where it meets the flatland. And what's happened is essentially that the ground in that, that zone in so many areas has detached slightly and it's moved as a mass. So it's broken away and it's moved slightly as a mass. Now, the amount of movement is very small, typically less than one meter across the whole feature. And that's what defines it as a class two or a class three, uh, essentially. So upon receipt of this information, the, the critical thing that we sort of took on board straight away was that GNS is saying there's no life risk associated with these features. There was nobody um, hurt or killed in these features in the earthquakes. And because the ground moved in a limited manner, we don't envisage a life risk. But there is a risk to property damage. And there are a number of um, properties in these areas that were damaged. So what we did was we spoke to, um, I'll try to, MB, Ministry of Business, Innovation, and that's the one. How's it? Environment. I don't know every time it comes up with that. But anyway, so MB, who runs the uh, works with, with the Building Act, um, we worked together with them and we developed a set of, well, they developed a set of guidelines to keep our residents work, um, living in these areas safely. It's basically like a TC 2 3 scenario. We just want to make it, the houses more resilient. And if, in the unlikely event, we've got another big earthquake or another big trigger, the ground will probably behave again. And that way, the, you know, we're a bit more resilient. So we pretty much put those to bed. Um, but our issue, obviously, is in the class one areas. Now, GNS Science gave us a stage one report. And um, basically, uh, just a quick summary. These areas, class two, three, uh, one, two, and three, you can see how many properties are in the red zone, post review. So it's as of now, the green zone, and then the total. The big concern, obviously, is those in the class one green zone, because they are potentially, GNS is saying, is that they are at an increased life risk. So that's our priority right now. We're, uh, we're working quickly into understanding this and coming up with a, uh, a, some sort of um, way forward. OK, pretty much um, geology 101. So just a, a quick um, cross section to show you the issues with the class one. So essentially, you got uh, a source area, so that's your existing slope. Um, it's been damaged to some degree, either with another earthquake or some very heavy rainfall. The water gets in there, and if it fails, it's going to run out into what uh, we call the debris area. Now, the issue with that is basically, if you're in the way, um, I'm looking at Tony here, but I would quite safely say, you know, the probabilities of you as a person getting out of the way of such a feature with your life intact is very, very remote. So that's the issue, okay, we have. Um, just a quick picture of the uh, class, uh, sort of a class two or class three example. Um, the, um, the bottom, the sort of left-hand side is the, 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 the slope and where it meets the flat land on the sort of the right-hand side. So we have a tension zone, the, the top of the, um, the mass movement where it's split apart from the, uh, the rest of the ground and it's moved down the hill, and then the blue is the compression zone where the toe of the feature is butted up against the land that hasn't moved, and it's caused a zone of compression. So we, we've got a good handle on those, we've mapped the, um, the, the features very well, and we know how to manage them. A couple of pictures. Um, these are, maybe a no, no, I thought there was another one. Um, just pictures of um, what we call the head scarps, so the top of these mass movement features. You can see the, the ground has pulled apart. Um, you can see, sadly, for that uh, lovely old dwelling there, it, it went straight through it, um, damaged the house irreparably, and that's subsequently been demolished. But, so these are the mass movements. They, they, they've triggered to a limited degree, and if they carry on, they, they will detach and cause a lot more damage. So just a, um, to go back to where we're at with these, um, the, the, the mass movement areas really, I mean, or any of our slope instability, whether it's rockfall um, or cliff claps, the, the big one for us at the moment is that we've been told by GNS, they've looked at the science basically, and they, we said, well, we're in a heightened risk from another um, major earthquake. That's for an earthquake series to do with the Canterbury um, series of earthquakes. It's got nothing to do with the Alpine Fault. 
that's another one that's living out there with a, a risk to us. But in terms of our Canterbury sequence, um, GNS have basically modeled, taken all the amounts of the, the earthquakes, the, all the aftershock sequences, plotted their magnitude over time, and basically drawn a simple line saying, well, if life carries on the way it is, we can see that at some stage, our heightened seismicity is going to drop out to probably even a lower sort of level than was before. And that's what that graph's showing. So at around um, sort of six, um, five or six years, you can see that it starts to flatten out. So that was a, um, taken on board by um, GNS, looked at this and basically said, right, we can use this as one of our parameters to model risk going forward into the future for people in the Port Hills. Okay, so GNS um, worked very hard for us and Sarah and developed life risk models, okay. They formed the basis of the, um, the red zone, green zone offer because the government realized that we had a people in areas with a heightened life risk. And basically the risk, the, the threshold between tolerable and intolerable was defined as a one in 10,000 chance of a resident living in the Port Hills being killed in the Port Hills, okay? To put it into some sort of context, that's the same level of risk we take when we get into a car and drive along our, our Tony shaking his head. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, a, yeah, okay. Yeah, in a year, so it's the annual fatality. So it, it's the it's a standard N, NZTA use the same um, level for a, the car journeys in a year in um, New Zealand. Okay, so it, it brings us back to the subject of risk. Now, the way I see it, one person's risk may be another person's enjoyment. It all depends on how you perceive risk. You know, to me, I wouldn't bungee jump because I think it's just a stupid idea. I think it's, I'm averse to that type of risk. Other people do it for pleasure. And that's basically, in a nutshell, what we have to deal with in terms of policy and how we handle these areas. Okay, so I think my next slide, I will hand over to my colleague, Peter Duden. Team, so Ian has talked to you about the science, and what I want to talk to you about is how the science was used to inform policy decisions by the central government and to an extent by council and how it's also informed regula reg regulatory decisions by council. So the first um, thing that happened uh, is a series of decisions by the Minister for Earthquake Recovery between June 2012 and September 2012, which rolled out the red zone in the Port Hills for rock roll and cliff collapse through a series of decisions. And During that um, period of uh, June to September, council passed a resolution in uh, around about, the, I think about the 12th of August um, 2012, that they would fund up to, um, they would contribute up to 50% of the red zone buyout offer for rock roll and cliff collapse in the Port Hills. Once that um, program was rolled out, very shortly after it, the government announced um, a zone review process, which was commenced uh, towards the end of 2012, but took the most of 2013 to complete it was um, in part delayed by the concept, some of the long consequences of the Quake Outcast case, but that had the effect of rezoning properties, not only where the property owner had requested a review, but also where the, the uh, review panel and eventually the minister considered a review was warranted. And 33 properties went from red to green and 237 properties at uh, 96 addresses were rezoned green to red. So slightly unusual uh, kind of set of circumstances as a large number of those properties are unit titles in a commercial storage zone in Port Hills Road. But many, the, the review went much wider than uh, just review sought by um, individual property owners. So by the end of 2013, we had a almost complete um, red zone and buyout policy on the Port Hills for rock roll and cliff collapse. I think they've yet to make um, a policy for vacant land, um, commercial premises and uninsured properties. The council has, um, during the course of 
um, time since the February earthquake initially issued red placards um, and then later um, under an order in council passed in July 2011 has issued um, 357 uh, section 124 notices, well has issued section 124 notices of which there are 357 current. There are seven 124 notices still current on properties that are in the green zone. Two of those are in Crown or Council ownership. The other five have hazards either on site or very nearby that are capable of mitigation and some of the property owners already in this and under the pro in the process of mitigating them others we're talking to about how they might go about it or what assistance they might need the other area where council's regulatory functions have been informed by um, this the science and analysis is in relation to building consents for properties that are in class two and class three um, of the mass movement areas and MB worked with Council in the course of 2013 to develop guidelines for properties in Class 2 and Class 3 of the mass movement areas where it's either a new build or a rebuild involving a redesign um, of their foundations. The other two areas where Council um, has developed a policy in relation to mitigation um, for rockfall December 2012, they passed a resolution to fund individual rock fall protection structures in the red zone up to the council half share of the council Sierra red zone buyout. And to date, there have been three applications, I think, that have been approved. And then in December 2013, this council um, passed a resolution wanting the um, possibility of area-wide um, mitigation for uh, rockfall to be reinvestigated and that has been done and it's hoped to report to council in April um, on that.